Domestication kills the female libido. We have such cultural institutions and belief systems that shame women's sexuality, that control women's sexuality. So what we see if we look at the worldwide ethnographic data is that wherever women can have multiple partnerships simultaneously, they pretty much do. Mm. This idea that women are naturally more monogamous is hogwash. I never used a vibrator until I was either 52 or 53. Mm -hmm. I didn't have one. Would you be open to describing a really exquisite or powerful or hot sexual experience that you've had in the last few years? Yeah. I'm Layla Martin. I'm your host of This Tantric Life. This podcast is for you to learn about and be able to use the incredibly powerful system of Tantra in your life. I have been teaching and studying classical and neo-Tantra for over 20 years. And when you apply that to sex, love, and relationships, as I love to do, you end up having conscious relationships, the deepest, most epic and magical sex, and the kind of intimacy that you get to be grateful for on your deathbed. And I want you to have your own magical journey in your own way that takes you from wherever you are now to the most outrageous and true and beautiful expression of sex, love, and relationships that is available to you. Welcome back to This Tantric Life. I am your host, Layla Martin, and I am so excited to have a conversation with Dr. Wednesday Martin today. She is a cultural anthropologist with a PhD from Yale, which makes her an actual doctor. And she applied that understanding of anthropology to female sexuality. She studied the mothers of the Upper East Side and their anthropological behaviors of sex and connection and wrote a New York Times bestselling book called Primates of Park Avenue. She also does these amazing things like write a book called Button, which is all about a natural history of the clitoris. She went to Costa Rica and tracked spider monkeys because they have extra large clitorises and she wanted to know so much about this monkey so that we could know more about ourselves. She's also the author of Untrue, which is an expose of all of the ways that we have been misled around female lust and desire and relationship orientation. And she takes us into the reality of the science and not the bias of the culture so that we can live more free. All right. Welcome, Dr. Wednesday Martin. Thank you so much for having me, Layla Martin. That was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And I love your work and I'm really happy to be here with you. Thank you. So I would love to hear from you first. What are some of the most major misunderstandings about female sexuality that you have uncovered, exposed in your work? And what are the truths? Yeah, so the subtitle of my book, Untrue, is why nearly everything we believe about women, lust, and infidelity is wrong mm -hmm. and how the new science can set us free. Yeah. Um, so I was really dead set on undoing these things that had initially just felt untrue to me. But when I dug into the data, I saw and learned that they really actually were. I think one of the biggest myths about women is that they're less sexual than men. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we look at the worldwide ethnographic data, which is what I do, which is part of my training, uh, and even when we look at women close to us and all around us, what we see is, in fact, that only appears to be true. Mm. Female sexuality is really tied to our ecology, which mm. is just a fancy word for saying where you live and what's allowed. Female sexuality will kind of morph to fill that and do that and where things are disallowed female sexuality will be muted, mm. right? Because who wants to get shot in the face for having an affair or who wants to, you know, uh, be in trouble for having a, a baby with a man that you're not married to if you're heterosexual and all these things. So I would say, though, that's the biggest thing that had never sat right with me, this idea that men were just naturally more sexual than women. And when you dig into the data, you see it's untrue in several ways. Mm -hmm. You see that in places where female sexuality um, experiences minimal constraint and control, it will be like ebullient. It yeah. will be effusive. It will be strong. It will be selfish. It will be all the things that it's allowed to be. So whether that's like an imagined or a constructed community in Brooklyn, like like an intentionally sex-positive 
yeah. house in Brooklyn or, you know, a sex positive place in San Francisco. I'm naming ecologies that are very female sexuality friendly in some instances. So whether it's there or, you know, whether it's among the Himba um, who live in Namibia where they have the highest rate of extra pair paternity of mm. any small scale society in the world. That means you had a baby with someone who wasn't your Thank husband. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm here to let you know that if you want to stay connected to my teachings and if you want to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to sign up for my email list. Email list sounds old school and yet it is where I share my most intimate teachings, the path, process, heartbreak, and triumph of my life and so much of the content that I make for you on a regular basis. So the way you get on the email list is by heading over to laylamartin.com. Put your email address into any of the boxes you can also sign up for cool practices like sex magic or energy orgasm, totally free. Heading on over to laylamartin.com, signing up with your email address. This supports the podcast. It supports this entire work and is the number one way for you to receive the highest teachings of this path. And, and what, what's very common among the Himba is that women who are married have a baby with their boyfriend and their husband tolerates it and really nobody blinks an eye. Yeah. So you, it's, it's very hard, first of all, if you look at the worldwide ethnographic data to tolerate for one second this assertion that female sexuality is less than male sexuality. Uh, but I'm a comparativist. So in addition to looking at the ethnographic data, I looked at the sex research data, the medical data, the primatological data, the sociological data. I like to pull all the strands together. Mm. Now, what we know from sex research, and you might know and your listeners might know, sorry if I'm preaching to the choir, but we now have new ways of measuring arousal and desire. Preach. Okay. So I'll <laughs> tell you about it just because it's really cool. Because this book, Untrue, very quickly became um, a look at female non-monogamy across culture and species, but it really became like a valentine to mm. these female scientists who have been changing things in their fields mm. and changing our understandings of who women are sexually and socially. So this really cool therapist, Canadian named Rosemary Basson, had been taught that men were naturally more sexual than women. They just are. She was taught in her training. And, um, you know, men's libidos were higher than women's libidos, okay? So she was a couples therapist doing her thing, um, and she noticed something, which is that the women, their levels of desire were and arousal were as high as the men's, but they happened a little bit differently. Mm. Okay, so there's this model, this Masters and Johnson model of sexuality that sex researchers were taught for decades that, like, you know, you um, just suddenly feel desire, right? This is the equivalent of like being what you would call a horny person walking around like, wow, I feel horny. I want to have sex. Yeah. Which like women say if they get a testosterone shot, they suddenly understand. They're like, I want to fuck anything that moves. And they're like, whoa, what's going on, right? So you yeah. could almost think of it sometimes as a way that like a lot of testosterone might make you feel. So Yeah, I mean, Sari Van Andrus does really great work on testosterone and it's kind of refining our views of that. But you're, you know, Absolutely to this point that some people just walk around feeling turned on a lot of the yeah. time and want to have sex. So we call that spontaneous desire. Yes. It just comes over you like you want a cheeseburger all of a sudden or whatever. Or like, you know, you're just walking around and you're thinking, I'm, I'm horny. Like, can I find somebody to have sex with? Okay. We used to only measure spontaneous desire. And when we did only measure spontaneous desire, men were up here and women were more down here. Yeah. And then... Sex researchers like Marjorie Basson, she said, this isn't, no, these women are experiencing desire. It's just a little bit different. Same thing, same libido, same, same, you know, uh, like impetus to have sex. But it's, I'm going to call it responsive desire. And it happens, my friend Emily Morse, uh, the great podcaster of Sex with Emily and a sexologist, says, you know, she has said in conversation and when we did a podcast together, she said, you know, I'm not a horny person. I never was. I never walked around the world feeling that way. But she said, if I'm, you know, with somebody and they start to give me a massage or they touch my arm, it's on. Yeah. That's responsive desire. Yeah. And that's a very powerful metric of desire as well. And when we measure responsive desire, 
it goes from this. Here's men's spontaneous desire. Here's women's spontaneous desire. Now let's measure responsive desire. Whoa, here women are. Now let's measure women's uh, desire and arousal reported at certain phases of their menstrual cycle. Okay, now we have it's more like this sometimes. Okay, why does it matter? Why does the difference between spontaneous desire and responsive desire matter? Why does it matter that Meredith Chivers developed an instrument where we can now actually measure responsive desire? It matters because think of all the people feeling like shit. Think of all the men feeling that they're not enough because they don't desire their partner, male, female, identifies as neither, right? They don't desire them enough. They, they, their partner's libido's more than theirs. Then they think, I'm not a man. Mm, What's wrong mm, with me? Mm, mm, mm. Think of all the women who walked around thinking, and women would tell me this all the time. They were always telling me, well, you could interview me, but like, I'm a freak. Like I have a really high libido. I really struggle with monogamy. You, and when enough women tell you that they're freaks at, over and over and over, you're hearing this, you realize that we really have to redefine what's normal for female sexuality. So the first part of this was these awesome sex researchers discovering responsive desire in this more circular model of desire. Instead of like get aroused, have sex, done. It was more like, oh, like start having sex or start being touched or look at something that reminds you of sex with somebody. Oh, I remember when so-and-so fucked me from behind on this white blanket, right? Mm -hmm. And this white fuzzy, great carpet you have on the floor. Uh, then it's on. Yeah. Why does it matter? Because it sets women and men free. All these women coming to me saying, there's something wrong with me. My libido's too high. They need to understand this social science so that they know how profoundly normal they are. So that is one of the biggest myths. And you know what? I was at this conference called STAR. It's the Society for Sex Therapy and Research. And this wonderful rock star named Meredith, Dr. Meredith Chivers, also Canadian, like Rosemary Bassin, something in the water, I don't know what. And she, she got up and talked about how when we measure responsive desire correctly, um, you know, we can't assert anymore that men's libidos are stronger than women's. Yeah. And it's she so got so much shit for it. Yeah. Because that idea that men are more sexual than women yeah. is a sacred cow, not just of sex research, but it is the foundation of our culture. Yeah. Because it doesn't just mean that men are more sexual, right? It means that they have more of a right to be out there. They have more life force. They're out there. They should be the ones making laws. The women should be the ones staying home because they're, uh, yeah. right? Not right. So when we talk about libido, it very easily gets politicized yeah. and gives permission to people and takes permission away from other people. So it's still a sacred cow in sex research and it's bullshit. Yeah. And I also think, you know, if you've been socialized as a man who is, you know, sleeps with women, is attracted to women, that your woman's absolute sexual fidelity to you is a measure of your manhood, a measure of your power, a measure of your sexuality, then if you suddenly know what a sexual being she is, are you going to be able to sleep at night, right? And so that's why this fragile male psyche as well that we have to look mm. at of having defined, you know, modern masculinity and masculinity for the last several, yeah. several generations around female sexual fidelity yeah. to them, then the truth of female sexual expression could shatter that. And that could be a powerful thing if we choose to make it a powerful That's thing. That's right. And a lot of things, a lot of situations would have to happen on the ground for women to have the same degree of sexual privilege that men do, including the most fundamental sexual privilege, which is to be autonomous and to make decisions such as I'm married to you, but I'm going to have sex with this woman because she turns me on or I'm, you know, I'm married to you, but I want a threesome or I'm married to you, but I don't want to live with you. Um, th so for women's sexual autonomy to happen, female autonomy has to happen. There has to not be a wage gap, yeah. right? There has to not be a meaningful gap between male political uh, participation and female political participation at the highest levels. I always say, like, if we have three female presidents in a row, watch out. Women's sex lives are going to improve so much. <laughs> well, also, I, I, people, you know, one of the deep focuses of my work is to look at 
why is it that we have such cultural institutions and belief systems that shame women's sexuality, that control women's sexuality? Right? Where does that actually come from? Mm. Because as you said, female sexuality is even scientifically, they've seen it is very responsive to social norms, behaviors, and judgments. And can right? be super strong if it's not coerced and controlled by everything from slut shaming to getting beaten up to getting killed. Right. And so you're right. The opposite is true, right? It can be super expressive and empowered if it's supported. Mm -hmm. And it can also shut down. And to me, what's really sad about that is women don't look at the bigger cultural picture they look at themselves, right? I feel mm. numb. I don't feel enough desire. I can't have an orgasm with my partner. There's something wrong with me. I'm broken. Always, I'm not that sexual. Always. I have heard hundreds of women have told me that they're broken yeah. sexually. It's never like I was slut shamed because we live in a fucked up culture that socialized yeah. us all to control female sexuality and to do so through mm. shame and co coercion and threat of violence. No, I've never heard a woman say that. Yeah. They always say... I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. I, and I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not uh, good enough, right? Yeah. One of the things I've really looked at is if you are a teenage girl and you are being slut shamed, whether overtly or more subtly, and you have to control the expression uh, of your arrows, one of the things that you will do is start attacking your own beauty and body. Because if you invest mm -hmm, what would have been your erotic aliveness into hating yourself— You've shut down your power. And if you're in a society that tells you that your mm. power will get you kicked out of your tribe, will get you killed, will make it so no man ever wants you, mm. you have to find psychological tools to suppress your own power. So to me, this epidemic of female self-hatred and self-judgment mm. and criticism towards mm -hmm. ourselves actually goes to the root of cultural sexual suppression of women. Mm. And even last night, right, I was like at the refrigerator with my friend, one of my best friends, right? And she's done so much work and she's so spiritually enlightened. She kind of looked at me and she was like, so I'm finding like a greater degree of sexual expression with my husband. She's like, but I would only ever express it with my husband because I want to be one of those women that's respected. And right. The price is high if you feel sexually autonomous and the price is even higher if you act on it. You could yeah. die. That's another huge myth in our culture that – if we have this – you know, your point is so well taken also just about how it can be lethal yeah. for women to be sexual – um, and it can be lethal sometimes. Well, it can be dangerous for us even to think about being sexual because we have been censored so much and we feel so much guilt. And that's another thing that really surprises me. Every time I give a talk, um, how many women come up to me and are really embarrassed yeah. to talk about sex. Um, they feel ashamed if they think their libido is too high. Um, men do the same thing. Men feel really ashamed if they think their libido is too low. Um, and, you know, it's worth mentioning that men experience the downside of what I'm going to call patriarchal sexual shaming because men are just told, hey, here's what you're good for, your dick and your wallet. If, oh, those those aren't big? Like, go, go home, mm -hmm. right? So it's really damaging to boys and to girls growing up with these rigid ideas about how men and women are sexually because when we tell ourselves that men and women are a certain way sexually, we're telling ourselves that men and women are a certain way socially and that they, right? So when you start chipping away at the myths about female sexuality, people do get really uncomfortable. And one of the reasons they get uncomfortable is that you're chipping away at their ideas about who they are. Yeah. So it's really big to get to girls early and to teach them things about pleasure. My friend Sue J. Johnson, who was a TED fellow for a while, did this great project and it kind of reminds me of your work. She told me that she was teaching her daughters about pleasure when they were little in a wraparound kind of way so that pleasure would become part of their vocabulary when they grew up and became sexual. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of the opposite, you know, when you're talking about how girls really do inflict harm on themselves when they start feeling and being sexual. So this was Sue J. Johnson's attempt to work against that. So what she would do is she would if she was brushing her daughter's hair and her daughter went, oh, she said, does that feel good? Do you like that? Yeah, I love that. Or if she was like tickling her, if her daughter was tickling her arm, 
Sue J. Johnson would go, oh, that feels great. Um, and she was always teaching her daughters what felt good and what didn't felt feel good because asserting your basic right to not be tickled when you don't want to be tickled, to not be touched when you don't want to be touched, to not have to give a hug if you don't freaking want to give a hug is the basis of building some empowerment for girls and is the basis of feeling pleasure focused and not guilty in the bedroom and entitled. Here's what I love about heterosexual men and gay men. I love their sexual entitlement. I love it. They feel entired, entitled to pleasure. You know, they feel like they are entitled to an orgasm. And many and of a blowjob. Yeah, and a blowjob. <laughs> and they're super... So they can be super great about it. Yeah. And what's what's going on is there's this sense of like, yeah, I deserve this. Somebody told me recently, women can hardly accept a compliment, let, an, let alone an hour of cunnilingus. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and sometimes, too, I, like I see women can get so mad about that. Like, oh, he's so entitled about his pleasure. And I was like, but think about something great, that you feel entitled it. to have. I feel entitled to emotional safety. I feel entitled to emotional yeah. safety in my relationships. Why can't he feel entitled to pleasure? Why can't we all feel and entitled to pleasure? And why can't I feel entitled to pleasure? Yes. And one of the reasons is bullshit science telling you shouldn't. And plow agriculture, which is like, I get into that a lot in my book. But <laughs> plow agriculture really fucked women over and turned us into property and made monogamy and patrilineal inheritance and patrilineal naming uh, practice is a thing. Plow agriculture was really bad for women. Um, but, and you know, it's still, it's, it's so funny in plow agriculture ecologies, but also in places where there was plow agriculture generations ago, or if you marry somebody who was part of a plow agricultural culture generations ago, did you know that those people are more likely to harbor the following beliefs? If jobs are scarce, men should have them. Mm -hmm. And men just naturally make better political leaders. And of course, the third belief, women are just less sexual than men. So all my training is to, you know, look at how all those pieces fit together. And the things that we're talking about lead to, I think, talking about the second biggest myth that I um, saw there were very... Uh, a paucity of data to uh, back up this assertion that women are made for monogamy and men are made for multiple partnerships. Wow. I mean, that is a view that just completely takes out of the mix the reality of ecology. Mm -hmm. And the reality, I always say female sexuality happens at the intersection of the clitoris and the culture, mm -hmm. right? Of course, we're biological entities and um, we have, you know, neurotransmitters and we have sex hormones and we have all these things. But all of that can be muted or supported or even in actively encouraged, depending on the cultural container, which I call ecology. So what we see if we look at the worldwide ethnographic data is that wherever women can have multiple partnerships simultaneously – they pretty much do. There's this awesome anthropologist named Meredith Smalls, and she looked at the data of over 200 uh, cultures worldwide. It might have been 232. And she found that there was not a single one uh, without women um, getting into simultaneous partnerships. And we call them extra pair <laughs> copulations. Let's just call it extra dyadic sexuality, right? The dyad is the couple. There was not a culture worldwide where women weren't doing it, even in cultures where they would be killed for it. Mm. Now, they were doing it less probably in those cultures, but it was still happening. Mm. And in cultures where women sort of match men in terms of their rates of labor force participation, political representation, and educational attainment, you will see women, I hate this word, quote, cheating, unquote, as much as men. Mm. This idea that women are naturally more monogamous is hogwash, and it, it has been put to good use, as you suggested, as an ideology. But it just doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny at all that women are more naturally monogamous than men are. Absolutely not. I mean, there's, there's even more recent science that, that shows us that 
actually in most species, mate guarding is a better strategy for males than just kind of pumping and dumping, right? Ha- mate ha- guarding means like they're actually taking care of their mate, building there. the nest, yep. yes, taking care yep. of them. Yep. Yep. And that, um, that multiple consortship is yeah. a much more effective reproductive strategy for females. Yes. So that's a complete reversal of everything. If you are harboring this idea that – you know, I'm a dude or he's a dude, so he just needs to spread his seed. Science is not on your side. Um, so maybe get more creative in your thinking about your own sexuality and your partners and, you know, live or, it up. Or maybe he doesn't need to if spread his seed and not take care of his partner. So I think what I what I found when when I'll speak for women at first, women that that I've worked with that I know really well hear these ideas, right? Of like women can be naturally polyamorous, they can want multiple partners. They go in their minds to the worst experience of polyamory in our culture, which is like I am dependent on a man. I want him to be my man, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm financially dependent on him and I'm dependent on him to help raise the kids. And he wants to fuck some college age, you know, Mm. whatever situation. And eventually he'll just leave me for a woman Mm. 15 years younger, right? Like that's the societal fear that has been put in us due to patriarchy, right? You said the intersection of the clitoris and culture shows us female sexuality. Well, if you have no social, Mm. political, and economic power, like women did not have— Even up until, you know, it was until the 1970s that you could have your own bank account as a single woman in the United States. Yeah, I believe it was in 1978 that North Carolina finally banished the head and master laws. It was ridiculous. Hey, I'm taking a moment to share with you about one of my most powerful programs. This is the Vita Coaching Certification. It is a year-long professional training and how to have a tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships. It will not only transform your experience of sex, love, and relationships to the highest possibility for you in this lifetime, but will empower you with the keys, tools, and technology to be able to offer the same for your clients because you will have such potent results that you can get for clients in an area that they most deeply desire. You will also be able to charge premium pricing for your coaching packages. We not only train you in Vita coaching on the art of coaching, but also extensive business training so that you can sell your coaching packages as well. If doing one of the most powerful, most transformative, most effective trainings around sex, love, and relationships is something that you are called for to professionalize your healing gifts and skills, have on over to laylamartin.com, sign up in the Vita coaching area to find out more about the program or get on my email list anywhere on laylamartin.com and we will let you know about the program, when it opens, how you can apply and when you can join. You're right. So it's so recent that women are able to have social economic autonomy. So it, it's hard for us to go back like even that little bit and imagine how much you needed a fucking man. Like you literally needed him. You needed him to make money. You needed him to protect the kids. You, if you couldn't have financial autonomy, you couldn't be without him. That's right. right. So what happens is society changes, but our nervous systems don't catch up very quickly. So some of this female need for a man need for, for all of this is social. Some of it's biological, oh, but a lot of it is social. So what's course. really important is for women to actually see and feel that social conditioning. Yeah. Because back in the day, yes. when you needed your husband to take care of you more than anything else, the idea that he might sleep with another woman was threatening to your foundational security. That's the lively, right. Like the survival yes. of your children, it, right? Yeah. So we want to like be, I want to address that because so many women, it, the, the, it's a non-starter to even talk about their partners having other sexual partners yeah. or, and you can't talk Talk about wanting other partners. If your partner, like, like if I want other partners, then my male partner is going to be able to have other partners, right? Like it's, it's touching, not always, but that's usually the case. So what I want to invite women listening into is if you take yourself outside of patriarchy and let's say that you're, <laughs> let's say you're bisexual, for instance, but you're hetero romantic, right? And you have an incredible husband or male partner who loves you who wants to be devotional, who wants to take care of you the way the bird wants to build the nest and go bring worms for the babies and for you and stuff like that, right? Let's say you have that and your bond is so deep and you take care of each other and you want to be partners together. Now, nothing says you'll never get a divorce or somebody's heart won't change, but let's say you have that foundationally 
And you could still, let's say every full moon, go have a wild experience with your lover who devoted himself to you, who worshiped your body, who went down mm. on you for an hour, that you got to revel in pleasure. And let's say your mm. husband celebrated you, like celebrated you. And let's say that he <laughs> wanted to have a threesome with one of your hot friends, but you never thought for a moment that he was going to leave you because of that. Because That's his right. ability to have pleasure That's with right. someone that you loved actually enhanced your dynamic, That's made right. you fall more in love, be more grateful for each other. And let's say on top of that, that you and that friend got to have really amazing sexual experiences sometimes like after late night parties, or you could go over and mm -hmm. have like really incredible queer sexual experiences with her, like instead of church on Sundays, right? Right? I want <laughs> I, like I want women game. <laughs> to put themselves in that scenario because that actually to me when I've experienced women's sexual liberation it's closer to that. It's mm. not this fear that like my yeah. all controlling husband is going to leave me for the babysitter, which is hell. It's joyful. Yeah. It's expansive. You use the word ebullient. I love that yeah. because I did this uh, this experience once with uh, we we had three couples. This is in my yeah. very long term partnership, so it's like basically a marriage. Two single women, and we we all got STD tests, and we played for a whole weekend and like a luxury Palm Springs experience. <laughs> and what I saw was women being so in their sexual power and so in their pleasure that we would come up with games of like, let's give so-and-so's husband a triple blow job and make him so happy, <laughs> right? And like, it's like, I'm not even, I think probably, yeah. people probably think I'm way wilder than I actually am. This was, let's say, one of my peak wild experiences in my relationship. <laughs> and it was so filled with joy. Every yeah. couple fell more in love with each other. The two mm. single women were not only in devotion and awe to our yeah. relationships, but they were inspired about the kind of relationships they could have. Everyone had mm. a better time. The women were in joy. But here's the thing that we forget. Mm. The men were in joy too, right? Mm. Women being in their sexual power didn't like break men's hearts. It wasn't like we were off fucking like whatever the male yeah. boy or whatever the, the patriarchal like fear is mm -hmm. with the, or the pool boy with the excellent body or whatever while he's <laughs> off making money. Like it's like, no, like we celebrated our partners. Mm. We loved everybody. Mm -hmm. We had way more pleasure mm -hmm. and the men were stoked. They were like, holy shit, my wife right. just wants me to have all this fun and play. And then we get to go back to raising our children and go to work with right. a twinkle in our eye. So I just want to paint that because I think That's sometimes when we're like, hey, scenario. women have this expansive sexuality and everyone's like, oh, God, because we imagine the worst possible outcome yeah, instead of what the reality could be. We do. So and I think it's really worth pointing out, you know, back to this point about ecology, you were able to engineer this because you created a community that would be more accepting of it. Yeah. So you and I are really privileged, I think, you know, and, and by the way, I love that story. I want a weekend like that in Palm Springs. <laughs> That's on my to-do list. That is a Apparently in bad. Manhattan Beach, if you want to go have an orgy with the other <laughs> married parents at like the PTA or whatever, you're like, hey, want to go to Palm Springs? That's what my okay. personal trainer told me from Manhattan Beach, okay. that Palm Springs is code for like adult play. Okay, I I love that. That is such good branding for Palm Springs. So you and I live in the sex positive community. There are even people at the PTA, right, who want to play with other uh, other parents at the PTA or other parents at school. And we're able to engineer these beautiful moments yeah. because we're able to make these ecologies where it's safe, where it's celebrated, where people are sex positive, where people are having STI tests, where people have good communication. And let's face it, where people um, have the wealth and privilege because uh, to explore lifestyles like polyamory and explore lifestyles like swinging and swapping and all the fun things that we get to do. And so for a lot of women, to your point, for a lot of women, that wouldn't be safe. The first thing I ask people I coach when they say, Shh, can I, I want to open up my relationship. The very first thing I say, and I have to say it is, will it be safe for you? Yeah. Right? Because we live, and I want to say something else. This point you made about women needing to be dependent on men, which we were talking about in plow agriculture and how yeah. that changed everything. Women, first of all, there is no non-human primate species where the female is dependent on the male. In all our closest relatives, our cousins, if you will, um, what we learn is they're never dependent on males, even in the last phases of gestation, even when their infants are altricial, totally dependent. They're not dependent on their male partner. 
So what does this tell us? That our ancestresses in all likelihood had a lot of these things going down still, a lot of this software, a lot of this still going on. We are freaks. It is an it is an evolutionary blip in time that women have been economically, politically, socially, emotionally dependent on men. You know how we think in science and social science and in evolution. I'm, I have my arms all the way out. Now I'm showing you my the fingernail on my pinky. Mm. That's how long women have been dependent on men economically, socially, emotionally. It is a blip. And this is why I love, you know, what you and uh, our mutual friend Mama Gina do. To me, you're getting us back on the evolution. To me as a social scientist who has a background in evolutionary biology, you're getting us back on our evolutionary script Mm. where female sexuality, if the cultural container allows it, will be selfish, will be fun, will seek adventure. And, you know, there are a lot of studies which show us that in partnered, cohabiting, exclusive relationships, guess whose desire drops really quickly? Women's. Women's, not men's. You're the only person. Everybody else says men's. (laughs) Female (laughs) desire in the first one to four years of an exclusive, living together, cohabiting, relationship in years one to four they start out the man and the woman we're talking a lot about heterosexuals today we're going to fix that in a minute. <laughs> so they start with equal libidos up here yeah okay the guy's libido goes like this over nine to 12 years i'm just showing it slowly go down here's what happens to the woman's libido in years one to four my yeah. fingers in the sub basement yeah. if you have one this is california i don't know if you have a sub basement that's where my fingers female desire domestication kills the female libido in the aggregate. There are some women who are exceptions, but I'm a social scientist. I don't talk about the person. I talk about people. I don't talk about the woman. I talk about women. And in the aggregate, women get really bored in the first one to four years of a sexual relationship. And my view of that is that women evolved to be, to use your term, sexually expansive. Mm -hmm. There were so many advantages to multiple mating for for females and for our ancestresses. They got really awesome sperm quality. What if you're just with one dude and he has shitty sperm? What if you want to, you know, we want heterozygosity. We want this like really robust genetic mismatch so that we have robust offspring and a robust pregnancy. You're not going to, what if you're with one guy and you're not heterozygous? You better like have some other ones, right? This is the software that's in there. What if, um... You're an infanticidal species, and there, you know, if you read the work of Sarah Hurdy, you'll see she's one of the evolutionary biologists who believes that in our not so, you know, long ago past, we may have been an infanticidal species. So that Um, would have meant that we killed our babies in the tribe? That the men did. Okay. Possibly. We see it in a lot of other mammal species, and we see it among certain non-human primates. We see Mm -hmm. it among chimps, but not bonobos, who are another story. So then the more of these males you had sex with, if they have sex with you once, they're not going to kill the offspring. They're going to run the calculus and say, that might be mine. Plausible deniability. Okay. (laughs) So think of all the reasons that it benefited our ancestresses to be, uh, to mate multiply. Yeah. And to do and to be a hoe, and to be a hoe, <laughs> and you see that chimps, female chimps, are so abject. It's like if you want to come back as anything, you want to be a female bonobo. You yeah. do not want to be female chimp. Female chimps, especially the low ranking ones, their lives are pretty hellish yeah. and sad. Right? Yeah. They could be killed for going off and consorting with another male. Yeah. They are the lowest rung on the totem pole. They will go out. They will consort. They will have sex with male chimps from outside the troop because the software is in there because it confers so many advantages. And clue phone for everybody. It's my view that the software, and I'm not alone, you know, that the software is still in us and that if you want to keep your girlfriend happy, do not live with her. Mm. If you want to keep having sex with your girlfriend, 
move out. Or at least have your own bedroom. At the very least, could you please have your own bathroom? Um, so but, there are a lot of reasons that it is it, that women get bored first. And the reason right. is that we evolved for multiple partnerships and for pleasure, to your point. We evolved for pleasure. Our evolutionary blueprint is to seek out pleasure. That's why we have a clitoris. Yes. And something that I don't think a lot of people know is that across almost every, you know, uh, metric that you can test, married men live longer, are happier, do better <laughs> than single men. <laughs> and and the ha- the opposite is true for women and the happiest <laughs> cohort in society is older Unmarried women without children. And those are the people that we huh? got socialized to believe are the most miserable in society. They're witches. They're the witches. They're crones. They're going to die alone with their cats. My Twitter bio used to yeah. say, you already told me I'm going to die alone with my cats. Um, but what people don't realize is <laughs> that like could be the happiest outcome. That's exactly your right. Your cats and your witchery and your plant That's medicine right. and your clitoris like, could Sign actually be a path to up. happiness. And the thing I want to articulate as well is like, you're married. Yes. Right? Yeah. And- I've had epic relationships. So I think people also think like, oh, if you behave that way as a woman, you know, like you're married. Every man that I've dated has actually wanted to marry me. I had a really hard time yeah. like in this period, this two years of, of after I uncoupled from mm. my long term partnership. I had a really hard time finding lovers because men continuously see me as marriage material. Why? Not because I'm mm. playing some game that I need to be saved, but because I'm empowered. I have my shit together. I will make an amazing mother. I take care of them emotionally. And I want to have fun with my arrows. And polyamory to me or being more sexually expansive to me isn't, oh, let me do this for this man. It's like when I have mm. more fun and more pleasure, so will he. And I'm not yet yes. like fully polyamorous. Like I don't want like whole additional partnerships. But it's not for I, everybody. I want to play at conscious yeah. experiences. I want to have amazing experiences with my bisexual lovers. He's fine with me every once in a while in a mm. blue moon, finding some gorgeous man who pleasures me. Right? Like we do design it yeah. to our delight, our That's delight. Right. That's so different than I think how the female brain has learned to think in patriarchy, which is mm-hmm. like worst possible outcome of losing partner or sexual expansiveness is for a man because all of the, you know, people are saying yeah. that's what men want. That's how men desire. And uh, like, that's what men want. That's what men desire. But, but it's actually, women who struggle more. Yeah. Yeah. How as a woman even in a long-term marriage or a long-term partnership, can you design your arrows so that your pleasure is fulfilled in this precious short lifetime? This is a great goal, and it's a great question, and I think it's the $10 million question or $100 billion question. You know, and it has to do with with patriarchy. I just want to quickly say, like, a lot of people think, like, oh, you're just throwing around a feminist word uh, when you use the term patriarchy. Um, I'm not, we're not. As an anthropologist, I know exactly what patriarchy is because I'm trained to look at different cultures. So a patriarchy is any ecological setting where there are these descriptively verifiable differences between men and women, differences in income, differences in educational attainment, differences in meaningful political representation, okay? And men are doing better on those metrics and other metrics that are meaningful metrics of power, comfort, even happiness. Yeah. So it's just very clear what a patriarchy is. And you, to your point, you know, we live in our cultural container and, and you're talking, I think, about women creating in their marriages or in their long-term partnerships. What I understand you to be saying is, you want women to be able to create a culture of female pleasure and to be able to use that language that some people just don't even know what it means still. Yeah. And you and, you know, Mama Gina and Emily Morris and I and many other uh, podcasters, men and women, thinkers, thought leaders are working toward the point where, I mean, for God's sake, when I got married, there was no discussion about monogamy. It was presumed. I call that compulsory monogamy, right? There was no understanding. It would have helped my marriage so much in the marriages of so many people if they understood that within years one to four, women experience this drop. And that drop is directly related to their deep need, their wiring for sexual variety, for sexual novelty, and for sexual adventure, which we've given all 
to being a guy thing, yeah. right? So the number of marriages and long-term partnerships that could become more creative, more mutually pleasurable, more mutually joyful, I love that you keep bringing us back to that possibility. And Yeah, because I think people think polyamory equals the demise of sacred devotional partnership, but it doesn't have to. No. I wanted to say a thing about my marriage, too, that I'm married. I'm really privileged like you are, you know, and um, I sort of lived in an ecological niche. I lived in New York for the last 35 years, and then I moved here a couple of years ago. But I, I lived in a politically progressive niche. Yeah. But marriage and monogamy were still considered like the baseline and the normal, cows, yeah. the normal thing that people do. So my husband and I are married, but we're in a living apart together relationship for the last almost three years. And he sees other people, and so do I. And um, it's a marriage. Yeah. It's just not a marriage that um, is mainstream yet. Mm. But I think that the more here, – here's a funny thing. In places like Great Britain, right, women and men disclose that they are having extra pair partnerships at the same rate. Mm. Now, men tend to exaggerate their sexuality and women tend to downplay their stigmatized behaviors. So what does that tell us? That women are having more. Women yeah. in the UK are probably uh, stepping out, if you want to do it that way, say it that way, more than men are. Why would that be? To me, it's so obvious. Hello, this is the land of queens and female prime ministers. This is the place. And to me, the ultimate— I did it for the queen, <laughs> yo! <laughs> and to me, that's the ultimate metric of how much do we tolerate women having power is how much do we tolerate women saying, I want to be sexually autonomous, and that might mean an extra dyadic sexual involvement, yeah. right? So I live for that day, and I know that there are material conditions that have to change before we can get there, but I thank goodness that there are— privileged pockets where we get to do it. And I think our obligation is to welcome women with less privilege in understanding that their circumstances might be very different and very difficult, but, um, you know, to support women across the board, you know, yeah. sometimes I feel like I'm in an echo chamber. This has, I'm not talking about you. I'm just my own life. I'm in an echo chamber where like Instagram only shows me sex positivity. Instagram only shows me people out there talking in very smart ways about non-monogamy. Instagram only shows me, you know, progressive politics. And so I'm in an echo chamber, and that's why I always have to remind myself this is not safe for some women. Some women could die for exercising sexual autonomy, and they're right here in the United States. And so I'm committed to that. I know you are. Um, yeah, it's just a, a point to bring up. I'm here to reveal one of the most ancient secrets of tantric methodology, which is the shorter the cup but the longer the gold spoon – the more the pleasure. This, <laughs> this is sex magic. This comes from the supplement company mood that I created. These are sexy supplements. They are plant-activated formulations vetted by our all-female research team for efficacy, and they allow you to enhance the amount of pleasure and sensitivity you feel in your body. So sex magic is to be taken as a ritual before making love, before doing sex magic, before self-pleasuring, and it will enhance your sensitivity, will enliven your body. It kind of makes me feel like sparkly and a little bit glittery. It has vasodilation properties, which means you have more blood, which means you're going to feel more feel more alive, feel more awake. And you know what? Real important, it tastes good. So that really beautiful purple color comes from blueberries. It's sweetened with monk fruit. So it's got no like artificial sweeteners in it, no sugar in it. And it's it's really damn good. So you can find it by heading on over to shopmood.com. That's shopmood, M-O-O-D.com. Finding sex magic. And if this is something you want to use to light up your sex life, please join me because it brings so much more pleasure and delight to living an erotically charged life. Uh, again and again, well, my, I keep bringing My anti-racism training taught me to follow other like uh, Instagram accounts with a uh, very divergent yeah. intellectual but you views. Know how the I still get the try. right... Yeah. I still get the right wing Christian pastor coming up sometimes because <laughs> yes. I went out there. I was like, sure will. And then I was like, hey, James. Hey, James, I don't know that I want to see this. But yeah, I mean, so uh, to your point about creating a more female pleasure centric world. Which is important whether you're monogamous or polyamorous. Which is important sometimes we talk no matter about like, what. oh, it can open up the relationship. But even if you're in a 50 year marriage. Yeah. 
unlocking your eros as a woman is yes. so important. Quick product placement yes, question. Yes, let's do it. Uh, I have Sex Magic, which is uh, my company mood, which I'm so excited about. I didn't ask you ahead of time, so I want to make sure it's consensual. Are you <laughs> available to drink some of the Sex Magic I'm with me right now? I'm available to drink <gasps> some Sex Magic. I'm a scientist. I have a scientific background, so I looked at the ingredients first. They look very interesting. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> we're gonna. <laughs> I see. We're gonna be effervescent. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm down. I'm down for all the effervescence and all the sex magic. Shall I open this? I would love that. Yeah. yeah. Let me so participate. Could, could you give us a scientific definition of uh, what you mean in, in your research or assessment of interesting? <laughs> okay. I think there need to be more rituals. More rituals. So I'm not a person who's going to tell people don't steam your vajay. Yeah. Some people like that. <laughs> Just don't burn yourself. Because I... I respect that I don't like women getting exploited. I don't like women being sold a false bill of goods. I do love women having rituals around their sexuality, yeah. around their vulvas. Um, you know, it, 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 and I just I don't like them getting ripped off, which is why I looked at the ingredients here. <laughs> And I, and I can't wait to have this, having said that. And well, yeah, we definitely, we worked with a team yeah, of female scientists right, to I make know. sure that the ingredients I saw would, that. would actually do what they say they're going to do. And the, the, the sort of ethos behind the company is like there is no magic pill for female sexuality. Like there's nothing there you can take that's going to make you want to fuck someone. Also, sex is complex, right? So yeah, and also pay me a hundred cents on the dollar, and probably uh, my libido will. But in the meantime, give me some elixir. <laughs> But sex, as you're pointing out, is deeply psychological. It's, so having rituals and rites are very important, and plants can culture. be helpful. It's cultural. We don't respect plants as much as we could. All and our like medication take, comes. A lot of our medication comes from plants. So we take so many supplements, but like we don't take things yeah. that directly support our sexuality. So yeah. yeah. So let's try this. Um, right. Yeah, and you know what I wanted to say: the ultimate aphrodisiac is paying women the same we pay men. And having women in very, very high positions of power. But until That's, then. Until then. Until then, please Let's try enjoy, this elixir. But you know what I mean? Because we, we, we talk about female pleasure. <laughs> well, the <laughs> but it's linked to such shrinks. boring things. Female <laughs> pleasure is linked to the most mundane things, right? Mazel tov. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So this has some herbs and... So, yes, it's got saffron... Um, Hooperzine A, which is uh, oh, a moss. Wow, mine oh, just yeah. um, <laughs> we're getting. So I had I female ejaculated. So effervescent. Mine had a female everywhere. ejaculation. Right, we'll give you a little bit more so you get the right. Thank you. Sorry for the mess. I should have let you know. In sparkling water, it expands pretty fast. It's the it Sheila Deep. Did. So you have to stir it sort okay. of slowly. This is good though. I like that we literally like came all over I the did. Nice table. You did. That's, That's I true. squirted. Yeah, yeah. I, I said we because I put the dust in your jar, but that wasn't really fair. Is any guy <laughs> gonna get me a cum rag? <laughs> <laughs> Where is the cum rag? <laughs> Jameson. <laughs> I'm, of course there's cum rags here. Also, anything can become a cum rag, like a bath towel. So it's... this is a pretty color and it smells really good. Oh, yeah. And I have reviewed some of the data about saffron. I saw one thing that was pretty inconclusive, and I saw I saw another thing that um, suggested that it could have some benefits. So I need to make sure there's actually saffron in it. I, was, oh, okay. I hope that's not a different formulation, but it is this one. Yeah, and then uh, shilajit. Um, I had never heard of that before I read it. What is it? Tell oh, okay. us. It's actually <laughs> tell us. <laughs> it comes from cracks uh, between rocks in the Himalayas. So it's actually this thick paste that's got, I think, fulvic acid is the active component of it, but it gives you kind of like a rush of energy. Thank you. I'm so sorry for the wet spot. Yeah. <laughs> that's... I'll sleep on my own wet spot. Good old toilet paper, eh? <laughs> it's, um, Let's get it's, Dr. No, Wednesday like Martin, this. our esteemed it's guest, <laughs> some toilet what? paper. It. Okay. It's good. It's all good. It looks like paper towel to me. Thank you so much, Jameson. It's great because we had someone write in. She was like, you know. Thank you. I really like this on Instagram. She was like, I really, really appreciate the podcast, but I really wish you just didn't have the like the mood, like the drinking of the mood products. And I was like. 
how do you think we pay for the podcast? <laughs> All of this free material which you are consuming and is changing your life. <laughs> yeah, there's a little price to pay, and it's that this 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 smells like it's going to taste good. It does. It actually tastes surprisingly good for for so it, being it has the fulvic acid. Yep, huperzine A, which is a moss actually. So moss is like supposed to be all the rage now. Like you know how mushrooms were like the big thing. Like, now it's gonna be like moss. Okay, I'm still on mushrooms. I st- I didn't even know about moss. Well, I'm learning. The moss wave is coming, so the get ready. The moss wave is coming. <laughs> okay. So it also has science behind it oh, that wow. it increases lubrication. Um, and then okay. we did things basically that dilate your uh, your capillaries so that you have more blood flow, more sensitivity, things like that. I mean, right, yeah. because this is basically what it's all about is, yeah, is, yeah vaso, vasodilation. Is a dilation. Is a really good thing to have going on. And, yes, increasing lubrication. That's great for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And yeah, I really appreciate you bringing the scientific discernment to it because that is really important Well, it to me. sounds like you did that already. Which yeah. Is no, awesome. absolutely. I would never sell anyone anything that didn't go through extensive yeah. like testing. And like I said, I think rituals are very important too and we need more of them around female sexuality, around sexuality in general. Well, I literally made this because uh, when me <laughs> – <laughs> 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 It was not from the elixir. We're off to a good I start. forgot that there were bubbles. <laughs> Let me do that again. That was not. The elixir is very delicious. That was about. I forgot that it was effervescent. Okay, I'm going to have some. <laughs> Tasty. <laughs> So, yeah, the reason I made this was when I would get home from uh, from a long day of work or actually just shut my computer at home um, in my long-term partnership and we'd have a date night. I'd be like, I want to take something. Yeah. I don't drink alcohol or I don't want to drink like right now that. on like a Tuesday night. Yeah. It's too late for coffee. Like okay. why isn't there something I can yeah. take that like even if it's not going to like rocket shit me off into like having 12 million orgasms right now. Like but it will put me in the mood. Yeah. Like, help put me in the mood. What could that be? Yeah. I mean, all across cultures, people sort of, you know, we don't really do it very well, but all across cultures, people um, sort of put brackets around their sexual experiences and have rituals. Um, yeah. And, I mean, a lot of people are just, like, with children are just having sex when they can. Yeah. But, um, or not having sex. But, I like I said, this just makes sex maybe more intentional, which... Is an aphrodisiac in and of itself, I think, yes. you know, for sex to be intentional, to put some something into it ahead of hand, uh, beforehand. You know, about your point about vasodilation and that this does that. It's so important. Like a lot of people that I know, a lot of women say they kind of goddess themselves before sex. Yeah. They do these calming down things. Like they take a bath. They might have a little wine. I don't do that. I've been sober for 10 years. But they have a little something. Yes. And I always say, okay, now add the opposite of that. Because what we know is that if you watch a scary movie, if you do 25 jumping jacks, if you get things going, get your blood flow going like that, yeah, um, that's actually surprisingly going to increase blood flow and going to increase your – Hopefully, um, you know, improve, maybe even improve your orgasm. So, yeah, a lot I of the spa that. things make me want to go to sleep, but running five miles makes me want to fuck. So, it's mm. definitely, you know? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people who like to have sex after exercise, mm. and there's a reason for that, and that is delicious. Yay. So, we'll, we'll, we'll test afterwards. We'll see how like much we like. <laughs> I know. I'll go home and see what happens with my. Vibrator collection. Yeah. How irresistible does it look? Give us the update. How we'll many bad decisions notes. am I going to make, like on my phone? Going ah! <laughs> How many bad decisions am I going to make as I go through my burner? You can test the like <laughs> uptick in swipe rights after <laughs> drinking mood sex magic yeah, formulation in the that's afternoon. Right, but it is delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Layla. So the um, okay. So so as we start to kind of like land the plane here, yeah, in this fabulous conversation, I am curious. What else do you wish the world knew about sex and relationships that still feels hidden? That if it's safe, you can ask for the kind that you want. You can ask for the kind of sex you want. You can ask for the kind of relationship container you want. I mean, like I said, when my husband and I got married, there was no discussion about monogamy. And it might have been... A discussion where we landed on monogamy, which is what we did for the better part of two decades, um, 
because culturally the language wasn't really available and the ideas weren't really available for non-monogamy, except like among gay men. Yeah. For me and my friend groups. Um, so you can't, I want women younger than me to know that um, whether you're going to be with a man or a woman, you're entitled to those conversations and you're entitled to change your mind. Mm. You know, if you land on monogamy and then you change your mind or if you land on polyamory and you're like, holy hell, this is a lot of scheduling and I don't want to deal with all these processing, all these feelings like, fuck it. I don't want to be polyamorous anymore. You can change your mind. Yeah. Gosh, I just want women to have the sexual pleasure that is their evolutionary birthright. And if reading my book helps, if listening to your podcast helps, if um, if surrounding yourself with a community of people who prioritize female experience and female pleasure, whatever it is that helps, prioritize getting in touch with what makes you feel good sexually and what you want sexually because it's a deep part of who you are as a person. And it's my belief that the more sort of sexually satisfied you are, um, and I, I want women to go beyond sexual satisfaction. I want women to go to sexual joy. Mm. And so the more sexually joyful you are, the more you are in a place, and it is a chicken egg thing, but the more I believe you're going to find other things positive things happening in your life. And it's not a mystery. It's because you dared to advocate for yourself and feel entitled to good things in the bedroom or wherever you like to have sex. Worldwide, most people don't have sex in the bedroom. But And because you prioritized that about yourself, you have the capacity when you succeed at that to succeed at these other things. Like I said, it's a chicken egg thing. That's what I want people to know. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, to me, it's like a precious experience. Like having your health and fitness, right? Yeah. Like it impacts every area of your life, but yeah. it just makes everything better. It makes life what a great worth point. living. What a great point. Think of it as brushing your teeth. I mean, I gave a lecture one time in Italy and I remember I had a simultaneous translator and she was trying to figure out how to say, treat having an orgasm if you're blessed to be able to have them or just treat giving yourself sexual pleasure the same way you would treat brushing your teeth mm. as the most basic get myself out the door as a human being thing. And when she finally got it right, <laughs> people looked really shocked. Like, wait, I do this like I brush my teeth? Yes. Touch yourself. Enjoy yourself. Look at your vulva. Look at, you know, look at your clitoris. Get to know it. Read about it. Play with it. Enjoy it. And make it as important as and basic as brushing your teeth. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and finally, would you be open to describing a really exquisite or powerful or just hot sexual experience that you've had in the last few years? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think for me, the hottest experiences, I'll just explain it in a general way. But yeah, I love this exercise. Let me think. Well, for me, it's got. There's got to be some novelty involved. Mm. It doesn't mean a new person. Mm. I never used a vibrator until I was either 52 or 53. Mm. I didn't have one. Like I considered myself part of the sexual elite. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't need one. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where I got that idea. I've always considered myself part of the sexual elite. I couldn't really say why. Maybe because I've always been able to have orgasms and I'm multiply orgasmic sometimes. And so I just thought I don't need a vibrator. Oh my gosh, why would we ever be talking about need? Let's talk about what would be fun and pleasurable. So my husband, one of my best sexual encounters was my husband got me a vibrator and we used it. And here I was, 53 years old. I had never used a vibrator. It was absolutely amazing, mind-blowing. It's one of the like best things my husband has ever done. And I'm still... Honey, thank you to this day. Here we are, years later, loving those vibrators. I have a whole collection now. So I have these great sexual experiences when I add something new. It mm. could be a new person, It could, but it could also be like a new toy. Mm. It could be a new snippet of porn that I really like. It, just 
it's novelty is always part of the mix for me. Yeah. And as this sexually empowered, gorgeous, highly intelligent researcher, how is it being out in the world married? But it sounds like, do you date? Do you look for lovers? Like, yeah. Yeah. My husband and I are married but dating. Yeah. And it's been, I mean, oh gosh, how do I say this nicely? It has been such a revelation. I do two recovery programs. Maybe don't say it nice. Maybe and, just say okay. it real. <laughs> okay, I'll say it real. Uh, so I do two recovery programs yeah. plus I do therapy. Yeah. And I've been doing therapy for many years and I've been really working these two recovery programs for the better part of three years now. And I find that I have zero tolerance for anybody who doesn't own their part and anybody who wants me – like, don't ask me to mother you. I raised two children. So I don't want to be around anybody who has that vibe of they want free therapy, where they feel entitled, where they think that a woman's job is to therapize them. Mm. Go away. Go mm. do it with your therapist. Mm. Don't let the door hit you in the ass on your way out. Mm. And the the mom thing, it's so deep, you know, and it's I don't think it's men, that men are to blame. Um, that their mom stuff runs so deep. We live in a culture that's obsessed with mothers but still treats us badly. And so I kind of um, – I've noticed those two things in dating. Yeah. And I've just noticed how swipe culture is a culture unto itself. It's a whole ecology. It's weird. Mm. Um, but it's an ecology that's not going to go away. So as an anthropologist, I kind of wrap my mind around that, that there are all these new cultural practices, that there are all these new ways we talk yeah. and ways we connect and ways we're less connected. It's just a new thing and it's not going to go away. So I've had to adjust to that. So it's been really interesting. And also, you know, the cultural differences between men in L.A. and men in New York, they're very different. Yeah. They're very different. And I think my funnest date was with a, a trans man. Mm. And I was trying to figure out why why do I like this guy so much? Why is he so different from other guys? Why why is he messaging me in such great ways? Why does he have such great communication skills? I know some straight men have great communication skills, um, but they have to work really hard because they're socialized away from it. It's not their fault. And this guy was just so great in every way. And then we met and he, he was so awesome. And then later I realized that I l really liked this person so much yeah. because this person saw me. And one of the ways this person was able to see me was that he had been raised as a girl and as a woman. Mm. So that was a really interesting, like, peak L.A. dating experience for me. Wasn't expecting that. It was absolutely great. Is that what you asked me? Sorry, Layla. The yeah, no, just the how it is to be out there. To my head. Yeah, see? <laughs> It's not all bullshit. <laughs> yeah, so that's how we do it. My husband and I date other people, but we're a primary. Okay. Yeah, and beautiful. we've been married for 23 years now. Wow. Yeah, so the dating, here's the thing, not to repeat myself, but like I have no patience for anybody who hasn't, as we say, who hasn't done the work. Yeah. Like I'm not here to do the work for you, with you. I can't caretake anymore. Yeah. I want men to take care of me. Mm, mm -mm, you know, mm. if if the guy sleeps over, I mean— I don't want to make breakfast in the morning. Mm. I want him to. I don't want to rub somebody's feet. I want somebody to rub my feet. I did things for people. I'm 57. I have been other-focused since my earliest awareness of it. Since I was three, I was told to take care of other people, um, to put other people's needs first, that that's what girls did, that if you, that you were nice. I was raised in the Midwest where everybody's supposed to be nice, especially women, mm. and I, I've just gotten to the point of my life where I feel entitled to be treated like a goddess. Like, you're having sex with me? Like, bring it. Bring, yeah. bring all your relational skills. Bring all your skills of appreciation and communication. Tell me how awesome I am. I'll do the same. But, like, get it right or get mm. out. Mm. I mean that in Let's the most go, Dr. Welcome. Wednesday Martin. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. You already Layla, mentioned that people can read you. your books. They can follow yes. you on YouTube. They, can, they read, can watch your podcast. They can read on True. They can follow me on Instagram. I'm not letting go of this elixir. Have you noticed? They can follow <laughs> me on Instagram. <laughs> And now I'm on X or whatever Twitter was in threads, but just follow me on Instagram. I do a lot of sex ed content there. Yeah. yeah and Layla, love you. Love mm -hmm. your work. Want to know everything about Tantra from you. And just keep on. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to share with you a very quick 
but very practical way to help apply what me and Dr. Wednesday Martin just discussed, which is essentially, how do you reverse a lifetime of negative, untrue messaging that represses your sexual expression and inhibits your ability to create your own sexual destiny? So I'm going to guide you through a five-minute meditation that's going to allow you to overturn this inheritance and redefine and re-experience sexuality for yourself. So you can do this meditation seated or lying and just make sure that you have five minutes to yourself. You can go ahead and close your eyes and we're going to take three deep breaths, centering into our body, connecting to the sensations within you, really dropping in. I'm going to invite you to start with genital breathing, pussy breathing, cock breathing, whatever you want to call it. I wish there's a better word than genitals. And so what you're going to do is you're going to breathe in through your nose as though you could breathe into your pussy, your cock, or intersex genitals. And as you do this, I want you to connect with the present moment as if there were no story from the past, no history there in your body that you were just fresh here and now able to create absolutely anything from this moment forward because you are. So inhale now as though you could bring the breath all the way into your genitals. And as you exhale, keep your awareness on your pussy, cock, or intersex genitals. Now, as you continue to breathe like this, deep and slow and connected, I invite you to feel yourself release. So out of your sexuality center, really feel pussy, cock, feel your pelvic floor, feel your vagina, feel your testicles. And release from this area limiting beliefs, limiting stories, cords to other people, to experiences. On the exhale, let them go. So inhale, feel whatever wants to be released. Exhale, let it go down into the earth. As you continue to breathe, I want you to feel your sexual center. So it's like a ball of energy and space that surrounds your pelvic floor, your cock, your pussy, your testicles, all the way up to your womb space, your cervix. And in this space, I invite you to feel it coming so fully into the present moment. It's like the past no longer exists for this part of you energetically. There's nothing weighing you down. There's nothing holding you back. There's no limiting stories. As you breathe, feel it lift more and more into the now, into this moment, because this is where you can fuck from. This is where you can relate from. This is where you can make love from. This is where you can choose pleasure from in a way that is true to you and not your past and not the past messaging is by literally letting this energy center come fully into the now. Feel that as you breathe.
feeling blessing energy because the universe does bless your sexuality, your arrows, your body. Feel blessing energy fill up this area from the universe. I like to feel it as high vibration, gold, light, blessing. Just like you might offer a blessing on an altar, the universe is offering a blessing to your sexuality. And finally, I want you to feel from this place, if you could have whatever you wanted in sex, a relationship, if you weren't limited by stories, toxic narratives, limitations from the past, what would you want? What would you let yourself have feeling that now? And holding that as sacred, this is your truth. You deserve it. You are worth it. Sometimes for our sexual and relational truths, we have to have courage. We have to do the work. But I've always seen that it is worth it. So the meditation is now complete. Taking a moment to thank your body and your being. When you feel ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into this Tantric Life, this exceptional conversation with Dr. Wednesday Martin. You can catch further episodes on Apple and Spotify. And the way to stay most connected to me and this work is to go over to laylamartin.com, sign up with your email address anywhere. You can get free practices. You can learn sex magic, energy, orgasm, couple sexuality, tantra, all kinds of fun things over on the website, laylamartin.com. Sign up with your email address. You'll be connected to me. That's where I share my deepest teachings and the most powerful transmissions of my day-to-day -day life. You can also follow me over on Instagram at the Layla Martin and on YouTube, which is Layla Martin. Okay, I'll see you for our next episode and have the most ebullient and effervescent life.